everyone. Welcome to Forward Pinellas, our meeting uh, this July 14th, 2021. I'm going to call our meeting to order. Now we will uh, please stand for the invocation and the pledge. I don't know who's doing the invocation. Who's doing the invocation? Oh. Commissioner Long is doing the invocation. <laughs> About to put you on the spot. Let's bow our heads and um, I apologize somehow that went right off my radar. Dear Lord, <clears throat> please watch over us today as we gather to do the public service work of our mission to provide real public transportation options and planning for our region. Please help us make good decisions that are in the best interest of the citizens we serve and the region that we live in. With your will and in your name we pray, amen. amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, and thank you, uh, Commissioner Long. Uh, now we'll go around, if board members will please uh, introduce themselves for the record. Uh, we'll start with Mayor Cookie Kennedy and go around. Everyone. Uh, I am the mayor of the city of Indian Rocks Beach. I represent the 10 Gulf Beach communities, which include Treasure Island, St. Pete Beach, Indian Shores, Indian Rocks, all of the Reddingtons, Madeira Beach, and Beller Beach. Michael Smith, Commissioner, City of Largo. Council Member David Albritton, City of Clearwater. Patrick uh, Pinellas County, District 2. Julie ward Bajowski, Mayor of the Great City of Dunedin. Bonnie Noble, um, representing the inland communities and um, from Kennesaw City. Janet Long, Pinellas County Commissioner, District 1. Vice Mayor Patty Reed, City of Pinellas Park. Brandy Gabbard, Council Member, District 2, City of St. Pete. Dave Eggers, Pinellas County Commissioner. I am St. Pete City Council Member Darden Rice and your chair. Um, Whit, uh, would you like to introduce our new county attorney? I sure would. Um, thank you, Chair. I'd like to just formally recognize Ann Morris as our new attorney. Um, she's been with us for maybe almost a couple of months now. Uh, but we had a, um, a truncated meeting last month. As many of you remember, we had the power out here. Uh, those of you who weren't here to experience, it was a rare event, uh, but Ann, uh, we really appreciate you being here. She comes from Manatee County. She's a Pinellas County resident. I believe you live in St. Petersburg, and we look forward to working with you. Thank you. I look forward to working with all of you as well. Welcome aboard. Thank you. Our next section is citizens to be heard. Are there any citizens in the room today wishing to, to be heard on any items in today's meeting not already on the agenda for action by the board today? And Tina, you don't have anyone? Okay. So we will, um, seeing that there's no one who wants to speak, we will move on. And um, Wit, uh, the next section is yours. Yes, I'm very pleased to um, announce that we've hired a new planner to join our staff. Uh, Alexis Boback is in the back of the room. Stand up and wave. Uh, welcome. This is her first meeting. She started last week, I believe, and um, we are really excited to have her here. She um, works for Chelsea Favreau um, and will be primarily working on the MPO side of the house, doing uh, transportation analysis, data development, um, GIS mapping, a whole host of things, and we really are excited to have her here. She comes from a private sector uh, background um, and I believe lives in Tampa. So welcome, Alexis. Thank you. Welcome, Alexis, indeed. We look forward to working with you. 
So the next item is our consent agenda. Do any members wish to pull any items from the consent to be handled individually? Okay, seeing none. Uh, Tina, is there anyone here from the public who wishes to speak to the consent agenda? And no? So uh, may I hear a motion and a second? Motion to approve. Second. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Unanimous then, thank you very much. Uh, the next item is our public hearing items. Uh, we will move into the PPC public hearings, which will be conducted as follows. I will first ask Forward Pinellas staff to present the items. Applicant local governments are available for, for questions as needed. Once each presentation is given, I will then ask for proponents of the proposal to speak, then opponents, and finally, any other citizens who wish to comment or ask questions on the case. We will then hear rebuttal by the applicant as necessary and a staff response or summary. At that time, the board will ask questions and then I will close the public hearing and the board will deliberate and take action. So on to item 6A1, case CW21-08 with the city of Tarpon Springs. Um, hello, Nusheen. Hi, Chair, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. For the record, Nosheen Rahman, Planning Analyst with Ford Pinellas. Um, as Chair Rice mentioned, this is case CW2108, submitted by the City of Tarpon Springs. The city seeks to amend a property from the residential medium category to the employment category, and the purpose of this amendment is to allow the expansion of an existing warehouse slash constructions materials business that is located directly adjacent to the subject property. The property is located on South Diston Avenue. It's approximately between East Lemon Street and East Boyer Avenue. It has an area size of approximately 0.16 acres. And currently it is mostly vacant, though there is an unused shelter that is on the property. And surrounding uses include multifamily residential homes, retail and other manufacturing uses. The following is an image of the front of the subject property and the red uh, structure on that property is that unused shelter that I mentioned. Next, an image of the north of the subject property showing some of the residential homes. And lastly, an image of the east of the subject property reflecting some of the manufacturing uses um, that are near the property. This map in front of you portrays the current countywide plan map category of residential medium, along with the permitted uses and density and intensity standards listed in front of you as well. And as mentioned, the purpose of this amendment is to allow the expansion of the existing construction materials business, which is the purple property that is located directly to the north of the subject property, hence the proposed amendment to the employment category. And this is shown on this map in front of you as a proposed category, along with the permitted use and density and intensity standards for this category as well. To conclude, this proposed amendment is appropriate for the intended purpose and is consistent with the locational characteristics for the employment category. And on balance, it can be concluded that the proposed amendment is consistent with the relevant countywide considerations contained in section 6531 of the countywide rules. In front of you is an analysis of those relevant considerations. And lastly, there were no public comments for this case, concluding this presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any proponents who wish to be heard? Okay, seeing none. Um, are there any opponents who wish to be heard? Okay, that's a no. Are there any other citizens who wish to be heard? Okay. Then um, we will go to, we will close the public hearing and uh, go to the board for discussion. Any questions? A motion to approve. Okay. All right. We have a motion and a second on, on the floor. Seeing no other comments or questions. Um, uh, Tina, is this a roll call vote? No. Okay, so all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Great. That's unanimous. Thank you very much. Thank you. 
Um, so, Nusheen, I see that you're going to be doing the next presentation for Case CW21-09, City of Tarpon Springs. And I'm not sure if I mentioned this earlier, but we do have a City of Tarpon Springs staff here with us today, Pat McNeese. So thank you, Pat, for being here. Thank you, Chair Rice. For this case, the city seeks to amend a property from the employment category to the retail and services category. And the purpose of this amendment is to allow for the continued retail commercial uses of the subject property. The property is located at 41680 US Highway 19 North and is approximately 0.61 acres in size. It is currently a commercial retail building um, which housed a furniture store that is now closed and surrounding uses include predominantly other commercial retail uses and a storage warehouse use nearby. The picture in front of you shows the front of the subject property and you can see that it is that closed furniture store that I mentioned. Next, we have an image of the north of the subject property. Um, it's hard to see from the picture that was taken, but directly to the north is the Lowe's Home Improvement Store. So I've just provided an aerial image to provide a more clear picture of what's in the area. Next, we have an image of the east of the subject property, um, which primarily shows US Highway 19 North and also um, showcases some of the xeroscaping efforts by the city of Tarpon Springs. Um, these are essentially improved landscaping efforts um, from the city. In front of you is the current countywide plan map category of employment along with the permitted uses and density and intensity standards listed in front of you. Um, this subject property is on a primarily retail commercial corridor and this property despite being designated as employment has been historically used um, for retail commercial uses and the intent of this application is to accurately reflect that use, um, hence the proposed amendment to retail and services which is reflected on this map in front of you along with the permitted uses and density and intensity standards for this category. Now, as you're all aware, amendments that convert away from employment or industrial-related categories are required to address certain criteria um, that must justify its change per countywide rule section 6544. The city has submitted balancing criteria, which is attached to this agenda item, speaking about how um, this property is not necessarily feasible for employment opportunities. Um, and the main point that I will focus on today are the target employment opportunities that are available or really a lack thereof. Um, by and at this site. So at this particular property, under the retail and services category, um, the, prop the target employment opportunities that could be available include the following fields of financial services, information technology, medical technology, or wireless technology. And the remaining listed fields of target employment opportunities would actually not be practical at this site due to its limited size and location on a retail corridor near a residential apartment complex. So really the target employment opportunities um, that could be practical at the site, even at the employment category, could still be feasible um, in the proposed um, retail and services category. So we find that this proposed amendment balances against those criteria and justifies a change from um, employment to retail and services. To conclude, the proposed amendment is appropriate for the intended purpose and is consistent with the locational characteristics for the retail and services category. And on balance, it can be concluded that the proposed amendment is consistent with the relevant countywide considerations contained in section 6531 of the countywide rules. Again, um, an analysis of those relevant considerations. And lastly, there were no public comments for this case concluding this presentation. Thank you, Nusheen. Are there any uh, proponents in the room who want to speak? Yes, the attorney for the client, uh, for the local applicant is in the room. I, okay. I'm here to answer any questions. Um, otherwise, I don't want to take up any of your time. OK. So we have an attorney present for the proponents who can answer questions uh, if we wish. Uh, any opponents? Mm -hmm. Seeing none. Any other citizens who wish to speak, wish to be heard? Okay, seeing none, I will close the public hearing and see uh, what questions or comments the board has. Do I hear a motion for approval or? Yeah, a uh, yeah motion to approve. Okay. Second. Okay, we have a, a motion and a second on the floor. Uh, 
Um, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, great. That also passes unanimously. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Nishin. Um So item number 7A, uh, Commissioner Gerard with our, our uh, PSTA report. Uh, with the return of full service, PSTA began charging fares again on July 5th. We hadn't charged fares since last mm, March or April, I think. Uh, in combination with the launch of our new Flamingo fares system, uh, Flamingo fares is a smart card uh, that people load money onto and then use that. Uh, and there's a system in place where the riders will pay no more than $5 a day or $70 a month. Um, and they don't have to guess, the card will automatically do that for them. Uh, to incentivize the transition to fare payments, we are offering free rides through the end of August. Uh, riders can download the app or pick up a free smart card at any PSTA customer service location. Uh, and by, by September 1st, they'll be able to load value on their accounts online at any PSTA customer service center or at over 90 retail locations throughout the county. Uh, PSTA still offers half fare options for seniors, Medicare cardholders, and students. We're also looking at um, fare equity issues and whether long term we need to be charging fares at all. Uh, more on that later. Um, current magnetic stripe fare cards will be accepted through the end of the year, uh, and people can go to flamingofares.com to look up what's going on there. We also have a new paratransit uh, system running. Um, it's called PSTA Access Paratransit using our own private service provider, uh, First Transit. You may have seen the vans already that have PSTA on the side. Uh, PSTA, replace, or PSTA Access replaces our DART service and still offers riders to, rides to qualified riders. Uh, they can schedule a trip up to one month in advance for $4.50. We also expanded the PSTA access mobility on demand um, using Uber, Lyft, and wheelchair transport. Uh, PSTA is working with the city of Clearwater, FDOT, and Forward Pinellas to design and build the new multimodal transit center in downtown Clearwater. And on Monday, submitted a $34 million construction grant for a Rebuilding American Infrastructure with Sustainability and Equity Raise grant. Uh, so we have high hopes for that. The new facility would replace the current Park Street terminal, which needs replacing. Our, ne <laughs> our next meeting will be July 28th. Thank you. Thank you. And Whit, did you have something to add? Yeah, I would like to add something about the raise grant that uh, Commissioner Gerard mentioned. Um, we had a meeting with PSTA yesterday to talk about the raise grant application. They have revised their application to um, seek a maximum of $25 million from the federal government for that project. Uh, that's the cap on the raise grant, so they're asking for the maximum. The project cost, uh, though, is, is a little bit more than that. Um, so um, what the $25 million does is it lowers the uh, matching requirement that they need to match the federal grant because they all come in at 80%. So you've got to find that 20% local match. So they're about $2.2 .2 million short uh, in, in funds. So yesterday we told them that we would do what we could to um, ensure that the stimulus funds that are allocated to the MPOs um, that the intermodal center was at the top of our list for that $2.2 .2 million gap. So we'll be participating, uh, hopefully, in the financial success of building that long overdue intermodal center. It's a small amount, but uh, every little bit helps. Great. Thank you. Our next item is the T-BARDA activities report. Commissioner Long. Turn on your mic, please. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, T. Barta actually has a board meeting this coming Friday where we will be fo very focused on our strategic planning measures going forward given the governor's veto uh, of the last legislative appropriation for T. Barta. 
Um, secondly, the Citizens Advisory Committee did meet on Wednesday, June 16th, and they ran through four different alternative proposals for the BRT that the board is considering for regional service and to complement local connections with HART, BRT, the CSX corridor, the Tampa streetcar extension, and the future, hopefully, Brightline extension, as well as the Sunrunner. Um, the, the board remains continue, the, the advisory committee continues to remain very concerned about the fact that our funding for the Transportation Disadvantaged Program has, um, has gone away, and that is a serious program that provides a very much needed service, so we're very focused on taking all necessary steps to get additional funding. Uh, for that because it is a regional project which serves a very vulnerable population in the region. And as you all know, the legislative committees start in September this year, so we're going to be working very strategically on putting our plan together for moving forward in the legislature next year. And we're very hopeful that there will be opportunities to um, have joint meetings with the board of the Regional Planning Council. There's a lot of synergy there for the different works that go on in both of those regional agencies, and they cover pretty much the same exact counties. And so I look forward to bringing you back more information on that effort as time goes by. Thank you, Madam Chair. Any questions? Okay. Great. Thank you, Commissioner Long. You're welcome. Our next item is 7C. It's the uh, 18th Avenue South St. Petersburg Complete Street Concept Plan by uh, St. Pete's very own Cheryl Stacks. There's no action on this item today, so we'll do questions at the end of the presentation. Hi, Cheryl. Glad to be here today and to present to you an overview of our complete street study. Uh, this um, study was done with a, uh, an investment by Forward Pinellas as a part of our complete streets planning grant application. So we appreciate the partnership with Forward Pinellas in providing some of the resources for us to conduct the study and then also participating with us through the course of the study. Um, I do have other acknowledgements. Um, the, the slide shows all of our project visioning team members. We created a project visioning team to conduct the study. It was made up of different city departments and city staff, but also a broad group of community members and uh, key stakeholders and partners, such as the Foundation for Healthy St. Petersburg, um, you know, our, our the Pinellas County Schools, because Perkins Elementary is right near, near there, and also our adjacent neighborhood association. So it was a really great group and got a lot of really good um, input regarding the use of the corridor and how we can envision it to be um, uh, more equitable going forward. And so for the presentation today, I'll talk a little bit about the background, how we just determined we would define success, what those potential improvements are, and then where we ultimately landed with the concept plan. So the study uh, area and the study overview were really fortunate because um, shortly before we engaged on this project, uh, we had a health and all policies executive order that was championed by uh, uh, Chair Rice. And uh, we did a health impact assessment for the corridor. So that was a really good starting off point for the purpose of developing different um, uh, potential improvements on the corridor from a transportation perspective because we had a good understanding of some of the, the health issues that are um, prevalent on the corridor. So the study uh, looked at the section of 18th Avenue South from generally 16th Street to the east and 34th Street to the west. And the corridor really has two segments, and it's kind of differentiated based on the adjacent land uses. The section west of 22nd Street is generally more residential with some commercial activity and commercial driveways. The area to the east of 22nd Street 
um, is generally the, the opposite. It has far more commercial activity with, and fewer uh, residences. And so uh, we, we determined that we needed to look at each segment individual, individually and collectively to kind of determine what would be the best, um, the best uh, changes for the corridor. We looked at our uh, toolbox of, of what changes we could implement. Uh, first and foremost, we looked at lane reallocation or road diet and looked at some guidance from Federal Highways that suggested that uh, roadways with less traffic than 20,000 vehicles a day could be good viable candidates for, for road diets. Uh, there's some certain safety benefits uh, associated with that, particularly when the roadway configuration is a two-lane undivided, such as 18th Avenue South. There's an opportunity to make a more equitable allocation of the roadway itself and while maintaining capacity because you provide that dedicated left turn. So this is a great tool that we realized could be in our toolbox for as we thought about changes. Similarly, we looked at transit. And how can we improve transit on the corridor? We learned in the HIA that very few residents um, near the corridor, ha uh, there's low rates of car ownership in this general area of St. Petersburg and the Route 18, or the route that travels 18th Avenue South um, is a very productive corridor for PSTA. So we wanted to look at what can we do to improve transit accommodation uh, around the corridor and make it more comfortable for people who are using transit. Uh, similarly, we looked at um, separated bikeways and then wanted to have a clear focus on the intersections. So if we create this protected or buffered bicycle facility, how are we going to get people across the intersections? Because those are inherent conflict points. Um, by their very nature, they're conflict points. And so we wanted to make sure that we had looked at opportunities such as protected intersections that could be a viable opportunity to improve safety for uh, vulnerable road users. Uh, we wanted to make sure we had a lot of community input. We did convene that project visioning team. Of course, we were kicking this off right at the start of the pandemic, so we had to shift course a little bit. And our first project visioning team happened as a virtual meeting in May of last year. And it was a good group of people, again, like I said, broad stakeholders that participated. We did do a, a survey of our project visioning team members to kind of figure out what trap strategies do they think, knowing what's in the toolbox, what do they think would be most appropriate or what do they think we should be trying to pursue on the corridor. And the top consideration were separated bikeways and wider sidewalks, and followed closely behind protected intersections and crossings for people getting across the street. We also did an online survey, so not just inviting some of the key stakeholders from the neighborhoods and, and those closest to the corridor participate on the PVT, we wanted to make sure that we gave people the opportunity to participate in an online survey. So we mailed out these postcards to all of the adjacent property owners, we mailed them to the neighborhood um, presidents, um, and, and work through our social media channels to make sure people were aware of the opportunity to participate in a survey. We asked people what, about how often that they use the corridor, do they walk or bike, what's their level of comfort in using the corridor, any safety concerns or challenges. We had about 200 or just over 200 respondents to the survey, and I think where we did really well is that we were able to get input from people who use the corridor. 58% of the people frequent in the corridor for work, shopping, or um, community services, or, or worship. There are several uh, ch houses of worship along the corridor. So from that community input and the toolbox and other, um, the health impact assessment, uh, the project visioning team came up with a vision statement to guide how are we going to define success. And I think that this is really important. Um, 18th Avenue South is reimagined as a street that equitably reflects the identity and priorities of the neighborhood to support a thriving interconnected community that is safe and enjoyable for people of all abilities, walking, biking, taking the bus and driving. And so I think it was really important for us to understand that that was going to be our vision and that our objectives would include um, equity uh, for all modes and safety and looking at community health and sustainability. So from that, we started to look at what are the existing traffic conditions. We need to do a traffic analysis and see what um, what the roadway could handle for modifications. And so we looked at and did a, a synchro analysis and looked at the level of service of, of the roadway based on the uh, traffic volumes. And you can see the signalized intersections uh, generally perform very well, have a lot of excess capacity at this point. Um, and this also projects um, growth 
two. So looking, this is the existing conditions, generally at level of service C and B. Looking into um, rec recommended intersection configurations and even projecting um, added growth on the corridor, we still see that these intersections can handle a, a lot of change on the corridor that would be coincident with the, the different configurations, the preferred alternative that we come up with. So generally speaking, we could expect people to see about a two minute increase in the time it takes to traverse the corridor after the recommended changes. So we also looked at transit and bus stop coordination, worked very closely with PSTA. Again, this is a high use corridor for, for them. And we worked to look at maintaining where we should maintain existing stop locations, where it made sense to move some of those stop locations or combine some stop locations and then look to coordinate those with um, marked crosswalks along the corridor so that we can make sure that people could safely get across the street. And so we recommended some changes that we'll work with PSTA on to implement as we implement the recommendations of the study. Some other recommendations were generally adding better placemaking and gateway uh, treatments and looking at opportunities for painted intersections and added landscaping and then keeping in mind some septet issues with lighting. So ultimately where we landed um, with a preferred alternative was this alternate two, which was a shared and safe community space. And generally speaking, what that would do is utilize one of the motor vehicle lane or one lane in each direction to, to allow us to shift the, the, the curb in and create a separated trail on the north side of the street. You can see it with the number one. And so that lets us also somewhat chicane or kind of curve the alignment of the roadway a little bit to, to moderate the motorist speed. And then it also preserves an opportunity for us to um, create protected uh, medians to allow for better crossings. And so people are only crossing one lane at a time. So it does not introduce bike lanes on the roadway and instead it puts it as a trail facility on the north side of the street. And generally speaking, the north side was better because it connected to some commercial development, uh, Tangerine Plaza, it connects to Perkins Elementary School and some of the other uses. And so that's why we thought not, uh, the north side would be a better opportunity. We would also widen the sidewalk out on the south side um, as right of way allows and as we're able to do that with you know utility conflicts and those kinds of things. So our, our consultant also helped us out with developing an opinion of probable cost. Um, and then we also wanted to compare that alternative with just what would it take if we were to do a traditional 3R project where we just generally kind of bring everything up to standard and maintain the pavement of the roadway. So we wanted to look at what's the cost differential between doing that investment that we should be making as a city, but then also looking at that opportunity to compare it and see what's the added cost of doing this complete streets and making this complete streets an investment. And we can see that generally speaking, the difference per mile was about a million dollars. Uh, we did bring to the two alternatives, a separated bikeway to the project visioning team and that shared and safe community space to the project visioning team. You can see the project visioning team overwhelmingly supported alternative two that I, I described. We did put it out. We did a series of project videos and put it out on an online survey to again get some feedback from the community to see which if they had a preference in the alternatives. We provided the community also with a no build alternative to see, uh, you know, as, as, a, as an alternative, they could say that they didn't want, want to make changes. And so the feedback that we got from the community um, was a little bit split, uh, but in some of the comments, they also noted that they would be comfortable with either alternative. And so given that we had nearly half of the respondents on the survey say they preferred alternative two, and the project visioning team say they wanted alternative two, um, we feel like that's the, the right way to go for proposing modifications to 18th Avenue South. I think what's good about the community input here, you can see, is that most of the respondents, 40% of them live in the zip code in which the project is located, and then another 35% of them live in the adjacent zip code. So 75% of the respondents to the survey are going to be the people who are most closely affected by the changes on the, that we would introduce based on the recommendations of the study. And so here's what it looks like um, as a cross section. 
The existing, again, is a two-lane, undivided, no turn lanes, no dedicated turn lanes. But we found really from the traffic analysis that we don't necessarily need those. We could provide them where they're warranted. We would keep them at the intersections. But generally speaking, through most of the roadway, it could be a one-lane road in each direction that gives us room to reclaim some space for the trail. Um, and then introduce those medians for this crosswalks. Um, it does allow us to return some of our pavement space back to green space. And also the concept plan that the consultant put together identifies opportunities to co-locate micro mobility, such as bike share and scooters, and kind of a, a make those adjacent to some of our transit locations as well. So um, it really is thinking very multimodally. And the concept plans, I'm happy to share with anyone. It was a really ginormous role plot. And if I tried to put it on the screen, um, your eyes would not love me. So uh, um, we're happy to make that available. It was a very detailed concept plan. And so from here, uh, really, we're thinking that we're going to be able to introduce um, and, and advance the project into design probably at the start of this fiscal year, our city's fiscal year in October, and start to move forward with that. Uh, the, and then the other next steps are in coordinating again with the lighting and the utility and some of the subsurface work that needs to happen. Uh, but really, I think some of the next steps also are working with Forward Pinellas because this corridor was located on the Forward Pinellas Active Transportation Plan. So it's been prioritized for, for funding. So we're working right now with Forward Pinellas to, um, to work on how to um, divvy the cost or share the cost of this particular investment, given that it's on a local road and some of the, it's up, prioritized based on being on the active transportation plan and not all of the suggested improvements are, are really related to active transportation. It's more of a complete street. So uh, we're working right now in tandem with uh, Fort Pinellas to divvy up those costs and uh, we look forward to getting the project underway. I think. Really, it's going to be a great and transformative project for uh, South St. Petersburg, coincident with some of the improvements we've been making on 22nd Street. So, and with that, I can answer any questions. Thank you, Cheryl. Do we have any questions for Cheryl Stacks? I do. The, the different options we're looking at. Um, there wasn't a whole lot of difference in price between the, I think it was option B and option C. That's correct, yeah. There wasn't much a significant difference in price because uh, the, the first option would have introduced a separated bike lane, which would have had a, like a concrete separator between the bike lane and the roadway. And so by the time you add in all that cost of creating that separated median, um, it's, it's almost you know, the same price as moving the curb in and creating that protected trail um, adjacent to the roadway. And, and what's the timeline for when we need to get a sense of feedback on making a, a, a decision about those options? Well, the study itself is recommending alternative two, which okay. would be moving the curb in and then creating that trail. So I think we're comfortable moving forward with that particular okay. alternative, and that's the one that we'll be using in our application, or we did use in our application to FDOT. Uh, we do still have some community engagement and work to do as a part of our design process that we would typically do, and then uh, I think where we're looking for some assistance from at the state and federal level would be probably for the construction um, and, and looking at getting that in the work program in the next couple years. Okay, well, thank you very much. This is a very exciting project. Thank you. I'd like to just add, uh, Cheryl mentioned it, that um, you know this is at the top of our uh, active transportation plan priority. We've had some discussions about that active transportation plan in the context of the pedestrian bike overpasses for the trails. But we also identified a lot of different local road networks as part of that. And I just think this really speaks to what we're trying to accomplish, particularly in, in communities that have been disadvantaged from a transportation or economic standpoint. And it's amazing what you can do when you rethink the right of way uh, and how you can use that right of way given the context of the area. And your comments, um, I think, are very relevant to some other roadway projects that are working their way through the process that we may be seeing here at Ford Pinellas in coming months. So just kind of keep this in mind as a, a very creative and, and a very uh, community-based approach to, to planning for transportation. And I just want to thank the city for its work. Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Quick, quick question. Yes. Um, yeah, thank you for the presentation. A really, uh, really, really good. I, I also liked the uh, second alternative or the the one that you, you chose. Um, so, from a cost standpoint, and, and actually paying for it, if it was just a resurfacing, restoration, rehab project, City of Saint Petersburg, 
just another street project, they would be doing that cost. That is, that is correct. Generally, generally speaking, yes. Um, you, it would depend on you know it. We generally program those based on the when, when it's scheduled for pavement maintenance and those right. types of things. So this allows us to kind of accelerate that. I was just trying to understand. Yeah. So when you're looking for help or assistance or mm -hmm. partnership on this, um, yes. you're looking for that incremental difference above that amount, or what is your what are your hopes? So just I trying think to what, learn what from we've your... what we've done is we priced the entire project and we asked the consultant to kind of split it out into what's generally related to the sidewalks and the trails and some of the more active transportation pieces, and then what of it's more of the traffic signals and kind of more aimed at the motorist that really isn't hitting the mark for the active transportation. And that really kind of fell to almost a 50-50 split on a $10 million project. By the time you add design and you know soup to nuts, it's about a $10 million project such that about $5 million is really based on the active transportation components and then $5 million is kind of roadway signals, traditional transportation. Uh, motor focused. And so what we've been working with for Pinellas on and where we think we may have come to some kind of consensus is that, you know, it may be that the active transportation money supports those bicycle and pedestrian investments and then the city would come in with a local match um, at, at, at the nearly the same level. Sounds like about the same price either way. Correct, so if you exactly. just do the regular. And it makes some sense to see what kind of interest there is in, in creating the partnership. Anyway, thank you for your yes, for your you. presentation. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Cheryl. Our next item is 7D. It's our annual PPC budget and millage rate discussion for fiscal year 22. Hello, Rodney. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Chair. Good afternoon, Board. Um, I feel this is an equally an exciting agenda item as, as Cheryl's presentation. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I will uh, try to, to, to keep your interest, but um, this is the last step for this board in the budget adoption process for fiscal year 22. I'll admit it's been a bit of a challenge for us because of the impacts uh, from COVID-19. Uh, so the projections went from very dire in the beginning of the process and we shared that information with you. And then uh, over the last several months, they've gone to um, pretty encouraging. Um, and uh, those factors are related to things like uh, the unemployment rate, um, uh, being uh, down, home sales are rising. I think we all have anecdotal experience uh, with homes uh, in our neighborhood that are staying on the market for a very short amount of time uh, before they uh, before they are sold, and, and these factors have led to the current projection from uh, the property appraisers office of about a 6.6 percent uh, growth projection, which. Um, was much greater than we were dealing with in January. So back then it was about a 1% uh, projection um, from the property appraiser. So um, as you may recall, in our discussions about the fiscal year 22 budget, we talked uh, at length about the potential for a millage increase. And uh, that was based on a few factors, things like the meager projections for property tax revenues, as well as uh, the reductions in, in local contributions from Pinellas County and FDOT. Uh, but we have uh, worked uh, very hard over the last few months and uh, been able to um, change a few of those things. So, for example, uh, in working with Pinellas County, they've agreed to restore that local match, um, and we were happy about that. And as well, uh, with the property appraiser's projections, again, uh, showing that we will have an increase in revenues over and above what we thought about during um, the early part of this uh, budget development process. So those factors have allowed for us to put a budget together that allows for us to achieve strategic objectives while maintaining the current millage rate. So uh, the good news is that um, we feel like we have enough resources to do the things that we wanted to do at the beginning of this process without asking the taxpayers for additional revenue. And what that means essentially is there's about $2 million in the budget for, about, uh, for salaries and benefits and those personnel, what, the, what OMB calls personal service costs. And then there's another $2 million in operating expenses. Those uh, line items in, are, in, are inclusive of things like rent, professional services, and so on. Uh, we're also able to put a budget together that exceeds your adopted policy for um, the reserve account. So your board policy is to maintain 10% of expenditures in that reserve account, and we are about at 13.8%, so a little over $666,000 in that reserve account. 
So let's switch and talk a little bit about the, um, the increase in operating expenses over fiscal year 21. Uh, the primary driver of that increase is, uh, can be found in a professional services line item. That's the line item where we place resources uh, that are needed to do uh, special activities, uh, plans, or projects. So um, the, probably the, the number one project we plan to undertake for fiscal year 22 is the first investment corridor study. Uh, I know we've talked at length about that, um, that framework, both in the Advantage Pinellas plan and as well as in the countywide plan amendments that um, were made uh, a little while back. Again, uh, that work will work, um, will focus on um, one of the investment corridors that are in the LRTP to find ways to um, develop a policy framework to identify opportunities for housing that's affordable, workforce development and jobs access, and then tie those three together with enhanced transit service. So we are very excited about this opportunity and we plan to build on the lessons that we learned working with uh, the city of St. Pete PSTA and our other partners on the Sunrunner Rising TOD development study, which is um, very similar to what we plan to do with the investment corridor work. Uh, the second uh, key initiative for fiscal year 22 will be to update the 2008 Target Employment Industrial Land Study. Again, that is the policy document uh, that serves as that foundation for the uh, target employment preservation policies we have in the countywide plan. Um, we plan to do a few things with this update. One, we want to assess the effectiveness of the existing framework in terms of uh, maintaining and bringing maintaining land and bringing uh, high paying jobs to Pinellas County. We also want to learn what's changed in the past 13 years in terms of demand for target employment uses. And then lastly, we hope to um, identify um, best practices because um, we have a similar or a tangential assignment, a small dollar assignment going on right now, and we have done some best practices research from, uh, with communities from around the country who are learning that there are different tools that can be brought to bear uh, in this regard. We also have budgeted about $75,000 in uh, this line item to partner with Pinellas County's Housing and Community Development Department to develop a design studio pilot program. And this would be a one-year pilot that we would um, work with the county as well as local communities to help identify and visualize uh, opportunities for redevelopment and other types of change. Uh, we also uh, have funds in the budget to uh, convert our agenda process to Granicus. It's the software that the Board of County Commissioners currently uses, and I'm sure some of your local governments also use Granicus. And um, we are um, looking forward to, to the opportunity to um, make our agenda automation process a little more efficient. And then lastly, we have about $15,000 in the budget to uh, continue to work with um, the University of South Florida's Urban and Regional Planning Program for a second year uh, where they provide an intern to us and we provide a valuable work experience uh, for that student. The student also receives a stipend and a tuition waiver. So we're, we're pretty happy with the work that Austin Britt did with us uh, last year and we'll continue um, that partnership uh, for the 2021-2022 academic year. A qu yeah. a qu um, yes, Commissioner. Yeah, appreciate. Uh, so far, it sounds really good. Um, on the target employ employment industry, you said the changes that have gone on in the last 13 years. And yes. I'm assuming that'll include the, the state change of last year, the year before, or I guess it was last year on um, yes, Commissioner. Al allowing affordable housing on industrial land. Yes, um, that's a great point. And also, I would add to that another uh, factor that has entered uh, the decision making process is the, the penny four dollars. So now you have money available from Pinellas County for, the, for, for affordable housing and for target employment uses. And so those things need to be reassessed and, and incorporated into the work that we'll be doing. And then, of course, all the changes that are going on within the cities that change areas that would otherwise have been great sites for light industrial and we're holding on to. Yes. Um, hard to get out of our, 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 but maybe it's time to take a look at that as well. So I'm assuming that that'll be part of this. Yes, we we feel like it's going to be a robust effort. There'll be a lot of uh, local government participation okay. as well as uh, close coordination with Pinellas County Economic Development. Okay, great. Thank you, Rod. Uh, we also, uh, over the past few months, have talked to <laughs> probably uh, 
more than you care to about intergovernmental service charges. And so again, those are the charges that we uh, incur from accessing Pinellas County uh, services. And I'm happy to report that in working with the Office of Management and Budget, we were able to refine the uh, cost uh, to where we only are projecting about a $3,000 increase uh, in those intergovernmental service charges compared to what we paid for fiscal year 21. Um, so that's a huge uh, win in my opinion uh, because we uh, definitely didn't start with that small amount of increase uh, looking at fiscal year 22. And uh, lastly, I just want to always leave you guys with this uh, millage rate capacity chart. Again, the, um, the small blue bar shows the millage rate percentage relative to the maximum cap capacity uh, for the last, I believe it's about 14 years. So you'll see there that we've been generally between 8 to 10 percent of the, the millage uh, cap as an agency with the last six years being stable at 9%. We're very proud of um, our ability to operate the agency in a very fiscally uh, responsible and efficient manner, and um, we'll continue to do so for the, the years to come. Uh, the next, uh, the last step uh, for this board is action on the uh, budget and millage rate, uh, and then the Board of County Commissioners will hold two public hearings in, um, in September to adopt a tentative and then the final millage rate and budget for this agency. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you, Rodney. I really like your approach to this and I'm very thankful we got the 52,000 matching grant back from the county. Okay, do we have any questions from board members? Uh, okay, uh, yes, Commissioner. Yeah, well, Edwards. first of all, I think this topic is exciting, maybe okay. not as fun <laughs> as the previous one. And uh, I do have a cup of coffee, however. But, um, <laughs> but thank you, Rodney. I really do appreciate the work that's gone into this to make it come in for a really smooth landing. I, I can't commend you enough for, you know, Whit, since you've been here, you've been so responsible with trying to make sure that we keep that millage where it needs to be. And at the same time, when it's going to be necessary, as painful as it might be, I know you'll ask for it when it's absolutely necessary. So I really appreciate that fiscal um, caution that we that we bring to the equation while we're implementing a lot of good programs. So anyway, great work. I'd like to just add, if I felt like we weren't being effective as an organization or didn't have the resources we need to get things done, you'd be the first to know, mm -hmm. and we would make that case to you. But um, as Rodney said, conditions have changed for the better. Uh, the county uh, administrator uh, made, a, made me an offer I can't refuse <laughs> to quote a movie I just saw, um, which was to step up and add the 50000 uh, for the local match, which is great. Um, and, you know, honestly, I think I've told many of you that since we do have a local revenue source, I feel like we should be responsible for our, our matches uh, that we use for federal and state funds. Um, so eventually I'll want to, you know, maybe move in that direction, but it's nice to have uh, good partners at the county level and, and it all helps, so I appreciate that. Well, great work indeed. Tina, do we have anyone present in the room who wishes to speak on the fiscal year 22 budget? Okay, seeing none and seeing no more questions from the board, do I hear a motion for approval? Thank you. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, unanimous. Thank you very much. Our next item is also an action item, item 7E, adoption of the Advantage Pinellas Countywide Housing Compact. And this presentation will be given by Linda Fisher of Forward Pinellas and Evan Johnson of Pinellas County. Hi, Linda. Thank you. Um, I'm going to give a brief introduction, and then I'm going to turn it over to Evan. Um, but for the past year, Ford Pinellas has been a partner with Pinellas County in exploring how to address the issue of affordable housing. Um, as we all know, we're in a housing affordability crisis nationwide, as well as here in our county. Um, this issue is bigger than any one local government or one agency can solve on its own. And it's about more than just creating affordable housing, uh, houses and apartments for people to live in. 
Uh, we need to connect that housing with employment, education, and other opportunities through reliable transportation. Uh, that's become a major focus of the Advantage Pinellas plan, and implementing it is gonna take effort from all of us. So we've been working together to build a coalition of local governments and partner agencies. We're proposing a housing compact where all of our communities will pledge to work together toward a number of specific goals. And Evan is gonna to talk to you about that effort. Hi, Evan. Good afternoon, and good to see my county commissioners <clears throat> here today. Um, unfortunately, I woke up with a cold after last okay. night's hearing, so I'm blaming you all. Um, <laughs> no, just kidding. Uh, my name is Evan Johnson. I am planning division manager at Pinellas County Planning, and um, Linda has done a great introduction to what we're here, doing here today. I am very excited to say that, assuming that I do a decent job and you all agree, you all will be the first of our partner agencies to be approving this document. You only beat the city of Clearwater by one day, potentially, so just gonna put it out there. So don't mess this up, is really what I'm getting at. Um, so the countywide housing compact really is uh, but one part of what is our larger countywide housing strategy, which the county has been working on um, for a couple of years, um, hand in hand with Ford Pinellas, um, as well as primarily our other entitlement communities. Um, within the county. Um, we have, obviously we have the framework that Ford Pinellas has put together with Advantage Pinellas and the countywide plan. Um, we will, after the countywide plan, uh, compact is adopted, we will be going into uh, work on comp plan and land development code changes at the local level. Um, the county itself is already beginning kind of the background research on our land development code update, and we are moving forward with a comp plan uh, update as well, and, and uh, a lot of the other jurisdictions, St. Pete and so forth, are doing are very much along the same line, moving those types of things forward. Another piece of it is our Penny Four Housing Affordable Housing Program, which has um, uh, been very successful. Um, we have several projects in process now, um, and by all means, check out homesforpinellas.org if you want to learn more about those projects, and uh, as well as our summit, um, where we did some educational um, outreach in late 2020. The overall vision of the countywide compact is really to accomplish what was mentioned in the investment corridor study, which is how do we connect housing, transportation, transit, and uh, economic development and workforce training. So this is really um, the housing side of that equation and trying to bring in our community development partners, our affordable housing specialized partners, along with transportation and land use planning groups uh, to the table. Oops, sorry, there we go. We've had lots of collaboration starting, um, I guess our first official kickoff meeting was in December of 2019, um, where we all sat down, representatives from all the entitlement communities as well as the Foundation for Healthy St. Pete, sat down, talked through what this might look like, um, and we've continued moving forward with our major partners, um, as well as, I will also add, uh, the TBRPC, uh, who came in a little later in the process and has been working with us along the way, particularly from the resiliency side of the equation. Um, we continue to bring them together and everybody has been kind of, well, we've done a lot of wordsmithing lately. So um, that was something that we will continue as we move to, towards uh, implementation. Compact is primarily four major pieces, talks about strategic focus areas. These are areas where we agree to work together to, to focus on um, whether that be, and I'll talk a little bit more in detail, you know, economics, uh, socioeconomic issues, et cetera. Development of an action plan. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about what that will contain. Uh, shared messaging and marketing, um, we are moving forward under that Advantage Pinellas umbrella. Um, and so we will, i um, pretty excited to talk a little bit about what's coming with that, um, as well as the development of a regulatory toolkit. So what are those focus areas? Connection of housing and employment, health impacts. Um, Pinellas County has adopted a um, health and all policies program uh, at the, in the planning division, um, you know, building off of uh, grant money that we have gotten, um, and it's been an excellent uh, perspective and way to look at housing, land use, and all the other things that we're doing. Social and economic equity, accessibility, and of course, partnerships, which are always gonna be needed in what becomes a very complicated um, development activity. The action plan itself, um, our goal here is to, once this is adopted and signed um, by our primary partners, is really to start a conversation about specific targets at the countywide level. Um, 
I know City of St. Pete has identified a target in its, uh, at the local level over the next 10 years. We'd like to take that and expand it using countywide data and bringing our partners together. Um, I think our mantra at the county, at Pinellas County, is really it doesn't really matter where the housing ends up, what jurisdiction it ends up in. Our goal is to get more affordable housing and have the transportation system to connect it. Um, so we're looking forward to putting that together. Um, data sharing and performance measures, uh, the county will be working very closely with Ford Pinellas on that as well. Um, so that as we move forward, we can do tracking, um, dare I say, data dashboards and other such things. Shared messaging, um, as I mentioned, we are moving towards an Advantage Pinellas umbrella. Um, so housing will be part of that now. Uh, Ford Pinellas is working on its Advantage Pinellas website. We are working on a uh, similarly branded housing specific website that will be connected to that. And hopefully um, we'll be seeing that by the end of the fiscal or early FY22. We also expect to do ongoing um, education. We liked, we thought the it came out of necessity due to COVID, but we really liked what, um, what the response we got from our online summit last year. So we really want to try to find ways to continue that um, over time. And then finally, the regulatory toolkit is very much focused on, um, we all are working on different facets. Uh, as I mentioned, St. Pete has uh, moving forward with certain types of bonus structures and, and those types of things and their own regulatory incentives. County's doing the same. Um, we would like to not only kind of package all of that uh, based on what Pinellas County's doing and the folks in the county, but looking statewide, looking nationally, what are some really good examples that we can pull together? Personally, I think this will become really relevant as we move forward um, and we start to get other communities signed on. Those communities may not have the same capacity to do this type of work, and we want to be there as a technical assistance and technical resource for them um, as we move forward. So what's next? Um, hopefully today you all will approve uh, signing of the compact. Um, I have presentation in St. Pete tomorrow. I have, I did Clearwater twice this week. Um, so we're moving that along. I'm hoping to bring it to County Commission in probably late fall um, as the last signer, the last initial signer of the, of the compact. And then in 22, we'll start outreach to other communities and working on the action plan. So with that, I'll answer any questions. Thank you, Evan. No problem. I think we're probably going to have a few questions. I see uh, Mayor Bujelski. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you for your presentation. Um, as a um, city that's not included in this because I'm under 50,000 mm -hmm. um, for population, how do you anticipate helping f folks like me? Because when I look at your map, mm -hmm on your presentation, it looks like we could use some help, <laughs> given the yeah. nature of the map. Uh, absolutely, and um, it's very important to, to let all the remaining communities, um, all the remaining cities understand that it was, we, we made a determination to start with those folks who had the entitlement grants and were working in the housing space, whether it be through CDBG, et cetera. But it was always our intention to continue to work and bring other signers onto the agreement. And while this is the beginning stages, you know, we really see it as if the city of Deneen was to sign on at some point, we could become that technical resource. We could become, um, we could work with you all to help you problem, problem solve and uh, troubleshoot your issues um, that I know, you know, I talk to uh, Mr. Ironsmith quite often about his work and I know our CD uh, community development folks do as well. Um, so we absolutely know there's an issue. It's countywide. It is a bigger issue in some areas, but it's our goal to do continued outreach. Um, so I'm looking forward to coming to the city of Dunedin, educating everyone about the compact and talking about how it can benefit, joining the compact can benefit uh, the folks in Dunedin as well. Will you be making decisions on, like I know, mm -hmm. I know the county has put aside money um, for for housing, and will decisions be made on um, whether that money is being put towards a project based on entitlement cities versus non-entitlement cities? And no, we don't have any. Um, I mean, the current money that's been set aside has its own scoring criteria, um, and that criteria looks at you know location, need, you know, uh, yeah. government contribution, etc. Uh, we have no no 
intent at this time to do that, um, particularly as it relates to entitlement communities per se. Um, but we're all, the, the scoring is designed in that program, so if, if you do have an, uh, a higher contribution at the local level, if you do have a developer on board who's putting more money in, yes, you would be more likely to receive funding, but no other limitations. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Evan, thank you. I've been mm -hmm. looking forward to kind of digging into this report for a while. We, we know that we can't build our way out of this crisis and that the other end of the equation is bringing in better paying jobs. Mm -hmm. So where does that piece fit in? Maybe not within this plan, but where does this plan fit with that approach? Well, I, um, I think that first and foremost, from a housing, from a land use, from a transportation perspective, we all want to get in uh, lockstep working together to ensure that we're creating the right uh, connectivity access to jobs throughout the county, right? Because what we don't want is uh, folks who live in one part of the county to be geographically significantly limited in their ability to move, go to another part of the county for a better job. Mm -hmm. um, so that's part of it. Um, I would also say that, you know, the economic development, uh, Pinellas County Economic Development um, is, as you know, has just launched as of yesterday, brought their first three projects to uh, the commission for the employment sites program where they're really, again, focusing on how do we bring more target employment um, uh, jobs and new target employment uh, square footage um, into the county. The other item that I know is very important to Administrator Burton and is, and as well as WIT, is how do we connect with our education partners? Mm -hmm. um, and I really do believe that while I don't have clarity to that yet, I know that as part of our outreach in next year, we'll be, we'll be talking to them to figure out how we can make a better connection um, and how we can better understand their needs from a housing perspective. So I don't have a, a, you know, a solution yet, but I do, I do think this is one important step along that, along that road. Great. Well, as Linda said, it is a crisis, so we do have to respond differently. So thank you so much for your work on this. Thank uh, you so much. Um, any other questions, comments? Uh, Council Member Gabbard. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for the presentation. I'm so excited that this is before us today. I'm very excited. I'll obviously be voting yes. Um, affordable housing is something that I came here to work on. Um, so I'm very excited that we're going to be moving forward in a unified voice across the county. Um, I have very high hopes for that. Um, the ability for people to live anywhere within our county and access the jobs within our county is so critically important. Um, as the chair of St. Pete's Housing Committee, I'll be glad to see you tomorrow as well and uh, help to move that forward in the city of St. Petersburg. So I just want to thank you for your work. Thank you. And thank you, Chair I'm, Rice. I'm sorry to put you through the same presentation. It's okay. At least, it, like, you know, Chair Eggers earlier was talking. Uh, it's stuff I love, so I'm okay to listen to it twice. Thank you. Commissioner Eggers. Um, yeah, well, first of all, thank you uh, for, for the presentation. And I, I think um, in 2017, the voters decided that it was important that we take s some of our penny money mm -hmm. for affordable housing, but also for economic development. And uh, you mentioned last night the first three projects on the economic development side came out. The conversation earlier um, about our light industrial piece mm -hmm. and how critically important it is before we let go of it, there, there should be good reasons for that. And it's raising that bar that we're talking about, um, moving the AMI index so that we can move people, you know, as, as much as possible away from the lower AMI index. I mean, just it just makes total sense that we have the jobs, that we have the housing. So I'm excited about this. I think it's really important that we have a, uh, a concentrated effort. And I think there's plenty of room for folks to involve themselves if they're not one of the... I, I don't know what you called it, primary or major partners, but you know, maybe they're the, the early partners and the, the later partners or whatever. But I think there's right. a lot of folks that can come to the table and have a part of this. I'm, I'm excited about it. Good work. Thanks. Chair, if you may, I'd like to just yes. add that um, you know, I'm really excited that we put into the compact sort of a target of basically 1,000 units mm -hmm. that are affordable per year over the next decade. So that's 10,000 additional housing units. Uh, in that market space that we'll need to provide. And this really fits into the regional economic competitiveness discussion 
that the Tampa Bay Partnership has been spearheading and providing a lot of data and statistics on that. And I want to be able to show, you know, at the end of, say, three years or five years or 10 years, how Pinellas County is contributing to that regional right. economic competitiveness uh, indicator because ultimately more and better housing options in Pinellas County strengthens the whole region. And, you know, I don't want people commuting, you know, any more than, than others do from Pasco County or Manatee County or Hillsborough County uh, into our county just to have a good job. If we can provide a way for them to live here, it, it relieves the burden on the transportation network as well. So it all, it really is all integrated and I just appreciate you all thinking broadly about this. Thank you so much. Okay, so this is an action item. Do I hear a uh, motion to adopt the Advantage Pinellas Countywide Housing Compact? Okay, we have a, a motion and a second. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. Great, and any opposed? Terrific, that's unanimous. And uh, we'll see you tomorrow in St. Pete, Evan. Um, let's see here, our next item. Our next item is 7F. It's our executive director's annual performance evaluation. And let me just pull up my notes here. Um, as you may have seen in your backup, uh, the executive committee um, met on May 28th, 2021 to uh, review the, um, the surveys and the comments about um, Whit Whitlanton's performance this year. And um, pleased to say that based on the evaluation results and our, our questions and discussing our findings with the executive director, we voted unanimously to recommend that the executive director receive no less than a 3.5% salary adjustment, and that's effective October 1st, 2021. Uh, it may be noted that the 3.5% is slightly more than the 3% budgeted for all employees of the county and the, and the unified personnel system. Um, part of our executive committee is uh, Commissioner Long, uh, Council Member Albritton and Mayor Kennedy. And um, I would welcome uh, any of you to uh, make some comments or um, talk about the process and uh, your support for WIT. Well, I think the support for WIT, I'm happy to say, was overwhelming. And we spoke at great length about his leadership capabilities and how he has developed partnerships with all of our regional governmental entities and worked hard to help us find solutions to move our county and our region forward. And he's without questions uh, extremely well respected not only within our region and at the various and different levels of government but also throughout the state of Florida. And he does enjoy a nice relationship with our legislative body, which I'm very happy to say is not thought all that easy so often to do. So I think that bodes well for us as we move forward. And he is often seen as a um, collaborator and a consensus builder on our TMA meetings that go on and can tend to get very long-winded depending on who's there or who's not. And so um, I was very proud to be able to support an increase for WIT. And I do think he deserves a little bit above the rest because he's so extraordinary. <laughs> Julie, did you? No, I'm just... Oh, you... I'm going to talk after you if I can. Okay, well, that's up to the chair. But anyway, thank you very much. I thought you had a question. Um, so I'll let whoever else wants to. A council member, Al Britton, please. Thank you, Commissioner Long. You're welcome. So one of the things, I, and, I, and I agree with everything you say, said, because I'm not gonna repeat it, but what, Witt, um, what I always thought about Witt was, he was a, a collaborator, a great collaborator, 
bringing uh, county and municipalities together with issues that sometimes hard to explain. You know, when you take things back and say, well, why don't we just call Witt and have him tell you <laughs> what it is? And, and usually he has answers that you don't have. But I mean, I, and I've known Witt before I became on this board and always thought of, of him that way. So always been very professional and uh, do a great job. I'm glad you're with us. Great, thank you. Mayor Kennedy. I was just gonna say, you know, there's, I have known Witt since he, we hired him. And uh, there is a humble piece because when we did make, said the amount, he was like, you know, I'm perfectly fine just getting what everyone else, all the staff is getting. And, and I think that's an important point to make in this conversation today is that he, you know, but I do think that he deserved more. And just quick story, we went around the, the county um, giving presentations for when we were doing our, uh, all of our um, waterborne and, and all of the different uh, pieces that we were doing at the time for Fort Pinellas and we were in Largo and one of the commissioners got up and really kind of put it to us. And Wit just, I was taken aback that somebody was doing that. I mean, we were there because we thought we were doing all these great things and they, we, the commissioner started beating up on us and Wit came right over and was very calm about it, gave incredible answers and everything was fine. And, and I think that he does that in collaboration with all of the agencies and he's just, you know what, he's quick on his feet and I appreciate that, uh, especially when you're not expecting something and um, so, Yes, it was, it, was a, it was a very good meeting about WIT. The other thing is in the past when there have been issues with, with staff or, or um, I think WIT is very attuned to trying to change those things and, and, and working with the staff because, you know, now the days things are different. It's not like you're trying to have somebody who's at the head who's a control freak. You're looking for somebody who's collaborative and who has trans transparency amongst each other so that we're all working for the same goal. And I think that that's what Wood is doing. So I appreciate that. That's all. Thank you, Mayor Kennedy. Um, Mayor Bajowski. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I concur with everything that everybody has said. And I think um, from a small city like we are, um, even though, believe it or not, I think we're like the fifth largest city, but we're a small city anyways with only, you know, 38,000 people. Um, what I appreciate about Wit is um, he goes out of his way to assist us in connecting on our projects in our city, to connect us uh, with on transportation issues with FDOT or DEP or the county. Um, and, you know, I'm not sure if that's really part of his job description, but he does it anyway. Um, I'd like to think it is a part of that, and I, I'd like to think that he would do that for any city, but he has been extremely helpful, and believe me, we call on him quite a bit, maybe more than most. Um, so I'm very appreciative to have that kind of access and technical advice, so thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Eggers. I am, uh, I've been, uh, I was really excited when we decided to hire Wit, and I think, um, if I remember correctly, it was a unanimous choice, which it doesn't always happen. Um, and I think if people were to look back and do that vote again, it would probably be unanimous again. Um, I have a great deal of respect for, for Wit and the work that he does for with us here. I also have a great deal of respect for what he does with our partners um, and in in the area, in the region, but across the state, and the respect that he has um, when he speaks, people really do listen because it's important, his perspective on every item. So I'm a big supporter of his. I, um, the only difference I have with the, the group that rec made the recommendation is that I would prefer sticking to 3%. Uh, we really don't have a system in place to 
recognize, a, a, you know, other than what we're doing right now. Um, and, and, and frankly, I think his, his comment about being in line with the employees is probably well said, and, and that's what I would support. Uh, it has no bearing on my views of him as any kind of perf in his performance on the job. But um, I think 3% is, is adequate. It's in line, and um, that's my only comment. But thank you, Witt, for all the work that you do. And um, as chair and chair of the committee, uh, there was um, adequate discussion about the 3.0 versus 3.5, and our committee was very much in, in support uh, on 3.5. And I think we've all seen how important and what a critical role the many agencies and commissions play in our work. And over the years, we've seen agencies and commissions that struggle when we don't have the strong leadership we need. And we also have good examples of agencies that do really well under strong leadership. And I'm proud to say that Forward Pinellas is one of those agencies. And my experience also working with WIT is that I've observed someone who is just uh, utterly professional, uh, dedicated to his work, knowledgeable, helpful, and really um, is helping us meet some very important transportation and housing goals. It's not always easy to do, um, but his leadership and his steady hand here at Forward Pinellas, and as well as I think uh, a lot of our staff here is exemplary as well, and I think that reflects on the type of leader that Whit Blanton is. So um, I'm happy to hear a motion to um, let's see, let me get the wording here. A motion to approve, oh, I'm sorry, before we do that, uh, Tina, is there anyone in the room who wishes to speak to this item dealing with the executive director's annual performance evaluation? Okay. Great. Did you, did you have any words you wanted to say? Or? Um, no, I've spoken a bunch. Um, I really appreciate the comments from everybody. I would just like to acknowledge the staff. I couldn't do what I do without them. And um, I'm really fortunate and blessed that we've got a great team. Um, I won't name them all by name, but many of them are here. Um, not all of them are here. Some of them are sometimes invisible but they're really great employees and they do a great job. And I think we're all dedicated um, to this agency and to you all as board members. And that means a lot. Um, you know, I didn't know what to expect getting into government. <laughs> Never worked in government before. I have always been a private sector guy and it is different. Um, but now I think I'm, I'm adapted pretty well after about six years and I feel pretty good uh, with where we're heading. And, um, you know, this is where I hope to retire, you know, so I'm very happy if you're happy with me. So thank you all. And again, credit to the staff and the team. Great. Thank you, Whit. Um, do we hear a second? Okay. So we, oh, I'm sorry. So we do have a motion and a, and a second. Uh, 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 all who approve say aye, please. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. One nay. And with that, uh, this passes. And uh, congratulations and thank you for your exemplary service, Wit. Our next item is 7G. It's the Suncoast Transportation Planning Alliance and a new regional website. This is a presentation uh, to be given by Amy Elmore. Hi, Amy. Hi, thank you so much for uh, talking with me today. Oh, about the Suncoast Transportation Planning Alliance. It is our new regional uh, site. We have, uh, you know, we're really wanting as a region to speak with one voice because we know that transportation doesn't stop at county lines. So you may know this as the MPO Chairs Coordinating Committee, and we are now rebranding this to speak with one voice as the Suncoast Transportation Planning Alliance. We've created a new logo, a new brand, and a new website so that this can really be a one-stop shop for anyone interested in regional projects uh, throughout the Sun Coast. So I'll just give you a short tour of the website now. 
We've got information about who we are, what our vision is, what our purpose is, our boards and committees, our regional vision, such as our long-range transportation plan, transit and trails vision, as well as our tra uh, transportation funding priorities, all of our members and how people can get involved. And then we've got a short plug down here for the Gulf Coast Safe Street Summit. At the top, you'll see with our navigation, we have a little bit about us, our regional vision, and then some resources, and again, how to get involved. So this is really just one step in creating a regional communications platform so that we can speak with one voice on everything that we're doing. Our plan is to create a communication strategy so that uh, we'll be launching this towards in just a couple of weeks as a region uh, through news release, social media, email blasts, all that fun stuff. And uh, then we'll continue to meet as a communications team um, and uh, with the directors to make sure that we're pushing out messaging consistently and uh, really speaking as that voice to give people the information that they need. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Amy. Commissioner Long? Yes. Uh, Amy, I have, I, I'm sitting here and I'm listening to you and I'm thinking about all the different boards that exist that deal with transportation and regional transportation and have legislative authority and so my question could you just give us a little background on how this alliance was created and who is and where the funding comes from to support it and on what authority you're creating this message because I, I for 50 years have been working on messaging for regional transportation solutions and I think WIT and those of us that have served on the TMA see how incredibly difficult that is. So I am intrigued by, by your comments and exactly what, how you plan to pull that together when for 50 years it's been pretty nebulous. Absolutely, and uh, I'll, I'll let Witt speak to this as well, but so, so the Suncoast Transportation Planning Alliance is the new voice of the MPO CCC, the, the, chair's the Chair's Coordinating Committee, which the TMA sits under. Let me, uh, yeah, that, that's <laughs> yeah. fine, that's fine. Please, yeah. So the, uh, <laughs> we, we've got a little bit of a weird situation in West Central Florida. There are, um, oh, in an eight county area, there are six MPOs. Um, in our urbanized area of um, St. Pete, Tampa, Clearwater, we have three MPOs, and that's really unusual. Miami-Dade, Broward, and Palm Beach County is another area that's a multi-MPO situation for one urbanized area. Uh, and this has been in effect essentially since 1993, uh, formally, as a structure. It's in Florida statutes. I can't cite the, the exact locations, but uh, Florida statutes recognized that we needed to pull together more as a region. And so the Chair's Coordinating Committee was formed to do just that. Uh, subsequently, the Polk TPO was added. The Citrus Hernando MPO was added uh, over the years when they became big enough to have an MPO. And these are all federal designations. Um, and in Florida, we've, we've not done a great job uh, at creating the structure of government that, that responds to how growth has happened. For instance, we've got a District 7 DOT and a District 1 DOT, and District 1 is just across the Skyway uh, in Manatee County uh, or in Polk County, and yet Manatee and Polk influence the Tampa Bay area. The regional planning councils are kind of the same way. You know, we've had these boundary adjustments over the years, but nothing fits perfectly. So I like the Transportation Planning Alliance for two reasons. One, it speaks to what we do. We are an alliance of transportation planning organizations, and we have to, by law, federal and state law, coordinate. 
and, and, and align our, our issues and responsibilities and how we de develop data, how we develop our transportation plans, that all needs to be coordinated. What would it be like if Pinellas made a bunch of assumptions in our data and growth that weren't coordinated with Hillsborough and Pasco? We would be at odds from just the basic assumptions of how we do transportation planning. This format and this framework clears away so that we don't have disconnect on basic assumptions. What we do have sometimes some disagreement on is the outcome or the strategy or the solution uh, or where we choose to prioritize funding. But that happens in a cohesive region um, you know, where you don't have multiple organizations. So I think what this does is it gives us a formal mechanism to resolve those disputes, to work through them face to face. Um, the TMA leadership group for the three core counties has now been incorporated by interlocal agreement into this West Central, or, or West Central Florida Chairs Coordinating Committee or the Suncoast Transportation Planning Alliance as we're gonna call it forever, forevermore. Um, and so that's now legally um, incorporated within this um, statutory framework. Uh, we never had a chair and a vice chair before. We always had a facilitator and we operated by consensus. So now we have a chair, and um, Hillsborough Commissioner Kim Overman was elected as chair of the of the Suncoast or the TMA leadership group at the last meeting on June 25th. Um, so, so I think that gives us a lot more structure than we had two years ago. But it's this probably isn't the right venue to have this discussion. It probably needs to be more just questions and answers. But I hear what you're saying, Whit. At the same time. You, you are the one who showed me the sheet of, I want to say, and I'm doing this from memory, but I want to say there were seven regions throughout the United States, right, on one side. And on the other side, it listed those counties that that region represented. And the ones who had been incredibly successful, the reason Whit gave me for everybody's in the spirit of full disclosures, because I was waxing on about how this shouldn't have to be that difficult when other parts of the country have been able to put real public transportation solutions in place. And when you look at that sheet, it just leaps off the page of, at you that the one thing they all were able to do was to come together under one um, MPO. I mean, some of those regions had seven to ten, sometimes even more, counties that they were representing, but they came together, and it was through that vehicle that they were able to establish a real voice and a real message. And the reason that has become so important to me is because if you go to Washington, and some of you have been on those trips that I have been on, on behalf of PSTA and TBARDA, the first thing that the Congress wants to know is, are you speaking as a region? Mm -hmm. Is this a message that everyone is buying into? And we were able to legitimately say yes, because we had the authority from an existing governmental unit that was representing, but TMA is no authority. They aren't in statute. It was a voluntary group that came together several years ago in an effort to have a conversation. Mm -hmm. And so I, I don't know. I mean, I think part of the problem is that we've just got too many cooks in the kitchen or Indians in the tent or I don't know, whatever <laughs> that saying is. You know what I mean, though? I, I mean, I we you. are creating another layer that's supposed to come together with a message. If well, you don't have all the elected officials on board agreeing. I think you make some great points, Commissioner. I, I want, to, and I agree with you in general. Um, you know, Atlanta has 20 counties in its NPO. Well, there you maybe go, that's 20, a great 20. example. Um, but I, I wanna say, we're not creating a new organization here. This is merely a rebrand. This is merely a, um, a refocus of the name and the identity. Um, and we've done some other procedural steps to make us work better and more cohesively without going through the very painful process of merging the MPOs, which 
was rejected in 2018 by Hillsborough County primarily, but ultimately by federal law, uh, the largest city in the region has veto power over that decision. So that's the city of Tampa in our region. And unless the city of Tampa really wants to make it happen, we won't see a merged MPO. And I think my, rec my, my sense, and we may disagree on this, is that we can come together and speak with one voice around the things we do agree on, whether it's the Cross Bay Ferry, whether it's the West Shore Interchange as the number one priority in the region, or whether it's our multi-use trails network. It's gonna take some time on transit because we have some different philosophies, but I think we just keep working it. And I'm not sure that it'll be any faster by trying to go and merge the MPOs to get to that point. That can certainly be a parallel effort um, if folks are willing to pick up the ball and roll with it. But, you know, we, we had T-BARTA do a pretty extensive study in 2017, 2018, and they developed a lot of case study information. They developed a lot of recommendations, and ultimately it didn't go anywhere because we didn't have the support of all three counties and MPOs. So to me, this is the next best thing we can do. And the other thing we did I want to mention is previous to this, T-BARTA was in charge of facilitating and convening the MPOs. And I'm sorry, when T-BARTA rebranded as a transit authority with a different jurisdiction than this, a smaller jurisdiction, it just made sense for the MPOs to take back what, there is, what is already their responsibility in federal statute. So this is our individual MPO efforts uh, to work together as MPOs. And we, we're doing what a lot of other MPOs around the country are doing. Maybe it's a little bit different because we don't have 16 counties in our MPO, but that's okay. I think we can still get things done. Your points are great though. I, I truly agree with what you've said. And uh, before we go to Council Member Gabbard, I, I I hear Commissioner Long's point as well. Uh, my concern is that uh, merging into one MPO at this point wouldn't necessarily solve the conflict that we're having with Hillsborough. And um, yeah, I, I don't think that's, I don't think it's gonna minimize that conflict. It might make even things more difficult for us. So I wish that wasn't the case. But it sounds like, and I didn't realize that they're in a position to basically stop it anyway. Okay. Uh, Council Member Gabbard. Thank you, Chair. And uh, to your point, uh, Commissioner Long, I, I do certainly see uh, the confusion behind all of this and, you know, who's leading who and who's kind of, you know, the one that's taking, you know, the voice um, as the newest member representing this board to the CCC. I appreciate this website greatly because even for me as a board member and now the designated, you know, person to go here, this helps explain to me what the purpose is. When you just go on to T-BARTA's website where it lives now, it's buried, it's not updated, it doesn't have any real place. And for me, this is the closest we get to some level of regional cooperation. Because, I mean, I agree, I would never be in favor of merging the MPOs with the kind of sentiments that we get from across the bay at this point in time. Um, that would not be of interest to me, but regional collaboration and regional alliance, as this is now coined, is very, very important. And so I applaud you for doing this work. Um, thank you for helping me understand better what that role is so that I can serve our residents better. Um, and thank you, Whit, for being willing to lead on this, because I think it's very important, branding and how we communicate those efforts of regional cooperation are very, very important. So thank you. Good work, Amy. Commissioner Eggers. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think the regional discussion, I mean, we've been talking about it for a long time. I I think the first, when I saw that, I was, um, it was I guess it's just Confused, that's all. I mean, and I see the writing on there. It certainly then explains kind of what we're talking about. It would be interesting to see, since the TMA has been kind of put under the CCC umbrella, which I'm assuming 
is this, that somehow incorporating a spot, maybe you do have it there, um, committees, there we go. All right, so maybe, I mean, I, and I love that, thank you. Um, that really, I think uh, you, you start to have so many, again, I think the cooks in the kitchen kind of thing. Uh, I understand what you're saying. I mean, I don't, I think we want to have that messaging. So I, I, maybe somewhere else where that TMA leadership can show up mm -hmm. uh, with a little bit more, and I don't mean right there at the top, but somewhere where we can make sure that folks understand. When we're talking about this, re there's also a sub-region group that is made yeah. up of, um, as opposed to just a board and committee of, mm -hmm. I, because there's been a lot of, his, I mean, way before I was involved, uh, five, six, seven years now, of the work that's gone on there that is pioneering work for regional approaches. Had a lot of road bumps, a lot of twists and turns, and uh, I just think it perhaps needs to have some kind of first page presence in it, even if it's over. I, I'm not even, I'm not a designer of web pages, as you can tell. I, I already see it in my head. Oh, you well, <laughs> <laughs> then, then, you're, then you're way ahead of me. But I do think it ties in this local, smaller effort with that mm -hmm. big, that yeah. larger effort, and, and it keeps it, but the rebranding, I think, is great um, as long as we continue forward in everybody embracing that rebranding because otherwise it just becomes totally confusing, you know. Yeah. Uh, Coming up with the name was fun, but um, and, it, and Polk County still probably not happy with the name. They don't really think of themselves as the Sun Coast, but that's okay. They, they're okay with it. I will say too, I wanted to uh, thank everybody uh, throughout the Sun Coast Transportation Planning Alliance. We were able to get uh, some members from each of the MPOs to essentially create this communications team. So it was not by any means a one person effort, it was a team effort, uh, you know, it was a, a regional effort to create a regional voice. And I really appreciated all the hard work that went into this uh, from across the region and with, with all of the MPOs contributing to that communications team. We also did focus groups with the t -Bartis CAC and uh, with, with some other members of the public and had really great responses. We've incorporated some changes from those focus groups into that and uh, you know, to present what you see here today. So I appreciate that. Well, Amy, thank you so much. This is uh, really great work. Really appreciate uh, what you've done. And I think Commissioner Eggers had a really great suggestion because yeah. I'm sure you've noted, as have I, that if we're a little bit if we are a little bit confused <laughs> about it, um, others certainly would be too. And um, um, thank you for taking that into consideration, but this is great. And this is not an action item today, so if there's no other comments, uh, we'll move on to our next item. Thanks a lot, great work. Thank you. Thanks. And our next item is an action item, it's 7H, and it's our Forward Pinellas Legislative Committee Appointments. I'll be glad to um, Thank you. just introduce this item. Um, I wanted to move this up. Normally we do this like in September, but I wanted to move it up because we do have the legislative um, conversation, workshop, whatever we're calling that thing, uh, coming up on August 11th that Council Member Gabbard has been very instrumental in helping us uh, organize. And I'm very pleased to say we've gotten um, an overwhelming majority of our legislative delegation members to commit to attending. Uh, thank you, Tina, for all your work, and Maria for, for, for getting that word out, um, and, and, and Amy for doing the invitations. Um, I think we're gonna have a really great forum, but I wanted to go into that meeting knowing who our legislative committee members were for the year ahead, um, and so, um, you know, if anybody, we, we don't really have a set number. We've had it as little as three or four people. We've had it, it's, it's probably as large as it's ever been now. Um, but, you know, that gives us flexibility if somebody can't make it. So I think the committee does work uh, very well. And, um, you know, this is, uh, we're trying to get a little ahead of the, of the eight ball here and not be so reactive. So um, that's why we're asking for the appointments today. Councilmember Gabbard. 
Thank you, Chair. Uh, so first of all, I just want to start by saying thank you to WIT and to all of the staff who have been working so hard on the uh, workshop. Um, you should have all gotten your invites by now, um, August 11th at 1030. It's called Finding Common Ground. And um, that's essentially what it is. It is a concerted effort put forward by the Legislative Committee to really be more proactive as we move forward in our legislation um, issues and, and kind of stop that reactive kind of piece and uh, work better with our legislators up front. So I'm very excited about that. I hope that we'll see you all there. And I just wanted to say it's been such an honor to serve. I think that you know this legislative committee that's been put together this last year has done amazing work, a very collaborative and cohesive group. Uh, yes, it is a bigger group, but I, applaud that. I think that's great. We have a big county. We have a diverse county. So a lot of voices on that committee are, are needed and well respected and welcomed. So it's been an honor to serve. I'd be honored to serve again. And uh, I look forward to uh, our workshop next week or next month. Thank you. Well, thank you. Um, it, it's really exciting to see so many people uh, in the committee, so that's great. And um, Councilmember Gabbard also leads our city legislative committee, so it's just really a pleasure to see your leadership, your being proactive, uh, your relationships, your willing to travel when necessary, and, and really, uh, really making a difference. So thank you, Councilmember Gabbard. Uh, any other questions or comments? Um, Tina, is there anyone in the room who wishes to speak to this item? No, Madam Chair. Okay, do we hear uh, a motion to appoint these new members to our legislative committee? So and a second? Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Great, and a big thank you to um, all of our new board members who have um, stepped up. Oops, am I? Hang on. Okay, sorry, I didn't realize there was a second part to this. The um, the other uh, part of this vote, the next part of this vote would be to um, um, hear a motion to uh, to nominate or, or to nominate uh, Councilmember Gabbard as chair of this committee. I will make a motion to nominate Commissioner Councilperson uh, Brandy Gebbard. And I see a second. Any comments, questions? Uh, anyone from the public who wishes to speak? We took a motion and a second to appoint members, but I have no idea who you appointed. Are they the same seven from last year? We yes. didn't say who they are. are okay. Others. It is a... Commissioner Dave Eggers, Councilmember Brandy Gabbard, Councilmember David Albritton, Councilmember Bonnie Noble, Councilmember Patty Reed, Commissioner Michael Smith, Commissioner Janet Long, and Mayor Cookie Kennedy. Thank you. And the motion on the floor now is to uh, uh, vote for uh, Councilmember Gabbard as um, the chair of this big group. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Great. Congratulations, Councilmember Gabbard. And I'm going to turn this over to Witt for the Executive Director's Report. Okay, thank you very much. And, and sorry to throw you a curveball there. I, no, I definitely okay. ad libbed a little bit on that one. Um, so I have a few items I wanted to discuss with you. I, I didn't cover director's report in the dark at our last meeting, so this is picking up for a couple of months, but I'll try to be very brief here. Just on the um, spotlight update, um, I wanted to cover a couple things. One, uh, we had tasked one of our consultants to um, do some case study research on House Bill 1339 that Commissioner Eggers referenced earlier that, that um, allows uh, affordable housing to be in industrial or commercial areas, notwithstanding any local laws or regulations to that effect. 
And what we wanted to do is find out how other communities were handling this. So um, we identified about six different potential communities for case studies. We ended up uh, really diving down into two of them, uh, Jacksonville and Minneapolis, Minnesota. And there's some really good findings in there. Um, the report has not been shared widely yet, um, but the city of St. Petersburg is developing a framework um, for moving this forward, and they were very interested in getting the findings of this report. Um, what it does is it gives us something to build on as we do our target uh, employment industrial land study update to look at um, how other communities have preserved industrial and employment land and then allowed some modification or encroachment of other uses into industrial lands uh, through policy. So I think that that was really good. It's a good work product and we're gonna share that shortly. Um, I also wanted to mention that um, that study, uh, the update of the employment land study is um, just about starting to, for scoping. Uh, we're starting to pull that together. We hope to have the, uh, this ready to get underway uh, as soon as we start the new fiscal year in October. So uh, be on the lookout. We're gonna coordinate very closely with Pinellas County Economic Development and all of the economic development entities around our county on that one. Um, the investment corridor strategic plan that Rodney mentioned earlier, the $600,000 that was included in our budget, uh, that's gonna take a little bit longer um, just because we don't wanna overlap too many things all at once. So we'll probably start scoping that in the fall um, as well, but we don't really anticipate getting started until the uh, sometime early in 2022 on that one, maybe by uh, March or, or, or so. And we are going through a process first of screening which of the corridors we're going to actually study. Because you may remember from the Advantage Pinellas plan, I don't think you remember, but that's okay, that we have about nine corridors identified as potential investment corridors. And I wanna just do one first. I think it'd be too much trouble to try and do two or more. So we're going through an analysis of which one lends itself best to that, and then we'll get started in 2022. Uh, the next item I wanna discuss is the Honeymoon Island State Park and the Dunedin Causeway. Uh, hasn't been a lot of movement lately, but we have a phone call, I believe, later this week uh, with DEP um, to discuss their uh, construction effort to expand the entrance to the Honeymoon Island State Park. Uh, we are working well, I think, with FDOT, the city of Dunedin and Pinellas County on a host of safety and mobility improvements along the causeway. Uh, there is a lot of different grant funds that are in play here, um, including um, FDOT funds to, to the county and uh, our prioritization of um, uh, surface transportation funds for the intersection at Curlew and Alt-19. Uh, there is also coordination happening between the county and FDOT on a new crosswalk uh, at the Frenchies Outpost location. So a lot of moving parts. Uh, DOT and the county are beginning to work together on the turnaround uh, at the end of the causeway before you go into Honeymoon Island State Park so that when the parking lot does close, because it gets too busy certain times, it'll be easier for motorists to turn around, especially if they've got you know a trailer or something like that. Uh, and then we're gonna have advanced message signs installed so that you don't get to that turnaround necessarily. If the park closes and the lot's closed, you'll know uh, maybe before you even leave your house, but you'll certainly know as you're heading down Alt 19 or Curlew before you get into the mess. Um, so I think those are important steps and we'll just keep working that until we get all the funds in place and construction is complete. The Honeyman Island entrance is supposed to be completed um, before spring break. So that's what we're gonna hold them to, fingers crossed. Uh, they, they anticipate getting underway as of Labor Day and um, hopefully we'll have an update that everything's smooth and going on with that. Uh, the next thing I wanna mention is I had some really good meetings with Representative Cheney um, in the cities of St. Pete Beach, Madeira Beach, Treasure Island, and Gulfport. And I started out wanting to have these meetings because I was annoyed that um, uh, she had been working with these cities to get legislative earmarks in the budget for transportation projects that circumvented our process. And I really just wanted to educate her that that's, that's not cool, <laughs> that there's a better way of doing things. 
because ultimately that kind of jumps to the head of the line on things. But as I learned more, um, uh, and she certainly appreciated the education, uh, these are not necessarily the kinds of projects that we would prioritize. A lot of them are road rehabilitation projects that include resilience and sea level rise uh, treatments. And, um, and I'm not sure that there's really a good mechanism for getting those funded. Um, there's some new mechanisms in, leg in legislation that got approved this year, but it was a really good learning experience for both her and I about what the cities were all trying to do. And we both had this kind of idea, Rodney may kill me for this, that I think we're due for some kind of information sharing among our local governments about what they're doing for resilience, because they're all doing things, but they're all doing it a little bit differently, and I think they could learn from each other. And I was really impressed with what St. Pete Beach is doing and what Treasure Island is doing and, and Gulfport, and I think there's some good work uh, out there. So I just wanted to let you all know about that. That's the spotlight update. Um, if you allow me, I'll just keep ranting on here. Um, the next one is a, is a discussion by the board, um, and it's a, a discussion of returning to our former meeting space or staying in this location for our board meetings. And I really just wanna take your temperature about how you feel about that. Um, this facility will be available to us, I understand, uh, through the end of the year, so our meetings in September, October, and November, um, assuming we cancel December as planned. And then thereafter, I think we'll be forced to go back to the general, uh, to the assembly room um, at the courthouse. So um, I'm just gonna leave it there. There's no additional cost. There's no cost differential for doing either. Um, I did talk to um, Commissioner Mers, or Vice Mayor Mers from Safety Harbor, uh, who by the way, um, has been vaccinated twice, but has contracted COVID, and that's why he's not here. Uh, he prefers to stay here. Um, so I just wanted to let you know about that. Um, uh, Vice Mayor Mers from Safety Harbor. And that's just because he felt like it was easy to get to, there was no problem with parking, um, uh, and, and he liked the socially distanced setup. So I'm done. If you want to recognize people to weigh in. Um, Mayor Bajowski. Thank you. Um, I frankly want to go back to the way we did it before, and, and the reason I want to do that is I think it's easier on the employees. Um, I know in our own city, us moving around and everything was really, really difficult on them. I mean, we've got the, the folks that are doing the TV, and while they have a TV set up, it's still more difficult. You know, people, the employees are having to travel farther to come here, whereas before they're right across the street. Um, I just think getting back to normal the soonest we can would be beneficial for everybody. Thank you. Commissioner Bard. So I agree it would be great to get back to normal, but the example you just used with Vice Mayor Mers, and I, I pray he's okay, I send him all he's the okay. best, yeah. um, but he is not the first that I've heard of contracting COVID with this new strand that's out there, even though they're vaccinated. I've known four people in the last three days. So, I mean, I love you all, but shoving up on a dais that is not built for that many people anytime soon is not high on my priority list. So I would prefer to stay here. It's not costing any money. I do understand the staff concerns, but I mean, we're all making concessions to try to keep everyone safe. And it would just be my preference to stay here as long as possible. Thank you. Yeah, I think what, um, what we're trying to do is uh, create an environment at, at our, our normal location um, that allows for our uh, more collegial workshops as well as uh, be able to handle larger groups. And so uh, we are looking at, uh, we haven't made any decisions yet, they're looking at a spot across the street to build a work, I guess it would be similar to this, um, so that both places are, are located nearby. We talk about the issues that Commissioner Bujowski raised, but we also talk about the ability to still socially distance if you, if, you know, obviously if that becomes even more of an issue. Um, but in the meantime, we're gonna do our workshops here and we're gonna do, you know, MPO here if we want, and the TDC, which is a big group, is gonna continue to meet here. So um, 
I don't know when, if that's going to, that project's going to happen, uh, if it does and when it's going to be available, but I would imagine if we do that, that we'll be able to stay here until that's ready, maybe the end of the year, maybe into the first of next year. But that's still kind of a work in progress. Okay. So. Speak on this, Commissioner. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah I, I was going to say that that we are looking at keeping our meetings here for the for the same reason, and frankly, that dais has never been appropriate for these meetings or for or for uh, workshops. Tourist Development Council. They're just they're just too many people up there. You can't even move when you're up there, um, and so I think before we move our workshops someplace else, we're probably gonna have another space where, where Forward Pinellas can meet. At least that's my desire. So I certainly wanna stay here. And our staff is, our staff is here anyway. They're gonna be here and we're gonna be set up for televising as long as the county commission is meeting here, so. Commissioner Long. Yes, I prefer to go back to the courthouse. Okay. I don't like it here. <laughs> <laughs> it's too damn cold. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> How do you want to proceed on making a decision? I, I missed the first part of the I had to step out. Do you want to vote? Because uh, we've heard different opinions. <laughs> Okay, uh, and I apologize, I had to step out for a second. Um, I think perhaps the best next step would be for our board to vote on what we do next. So our options are staying here at least until November. Through November um, would be, I mean, I'd, I'd like us to have some certainty of what we're doing since we have to advertise these meetings and everything. So I'd prefer that we just know what we're doing through the end of the year. That would be easiest, unless a new space opens up before then. Okay, Council Member Gabbard. I'll make a motion. That, sorry, I'll make a motion that we stay in this facility until the end of 2021. Okay. I'll and second. from Largo, I'll second. So was that a second, Commissioner Smith? Okay. So we have a motion on the floor to stay in this building until the end of 2022. 2021, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> she was coming after you. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, uh, all in favor? Well, you should probably do a roll call, I think. No, I don't, I mean, you can if you want to. You, you can do a roll call. You're not required pursuant to the procedures. Okay. All right, all in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Right. And, well, and, uh, and we'll work on a, a heat a heater for Commissioner Long because she does <laughs> freeze in, in in this spot. <laughs> so we'll work on it. We certainly will. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for that. Um, all right. I will move on. Uh, I wanted to bring to your attention that we have made some um, bylaws changes to our uh, pedestrian and bicycle advisory uh, committee. Uh, it's a great committee. It's a hardworking committee. It's co it's comprised of technical uh, staff from around the county and um, actual people who ride and walk bikes who are who are, are lay people, um, some of whom have a lot of experience in transportation planning. And uh, Brian Smith is here. He's the chair of the the BPAC. So I wanted to uh, give Brian maybe an opportunity to to comment here. Uh, we had the bylaws changes um, that the committee approved uh, earlier this summer, in part because we wanted to uh, broaden the um, uh, network of advocates for walking and bicycling around the county. We wanted to uh, grow that um, constituency, and we wanted to ensure that we had a dynamic committee that uh, reflected uh, trends and issues and needs uh, of, a, of a wide range of our demographic. Uh, the challenge we always will have is that these meetings, um, you know, are centrally located in Clearwater. Um, they typically happen during the weekday, uh, during working hours, and so it is a bit of a challenge sometimes to recruit people who, 
you know, have kids, have um, two jobs in the household and things like that. Uh, and we are considering some options that might make the meetings easier for people to attend who have jobs and things like that. Uh, but we felt the first thing we ought to do, like our Citizens Advisory Committee, is to have term limits uh, for those committee members. And, um, and we made some other revisions that expanded the membership of the committee to add a seat in Dunedin, to add a seat in St. Petersburg, reflecting the growth uh, in those areas uh, of our county. And um, we are currently recruiting to fill those seats, uh, and we expect to have the five vacancies that we have now filled in, in short order. I think the issue that uh, Brian and some of the committee members have raised is that we had a proposal to term out uh, some of the oldest long-serving members at the end of this year, and I think that was five members, and then next year another six would be termed out at the end of 2022. And that is a, a concern about the loss of institutional knowledge, the experience, um, the, um, the contributions over the years that many people have brought. And we have people on the committee who were foundational uh, in, in creating the Pinellas Trail when it first got started um, 30 years ago. Um, so that's important. Uh, what we have done is we've created uh, a legacy committee so that all those members who are termed out will continue to receive materials, will continue to be invited to the meetings, and will be welcome to participate. Uh, but, you know, they wouldn't be able to vote, uh, but they would be able to weigh in. Uh, we've also um, done some other steps uh, to diversify and, and, and make sure that we have good applicants for that. And I think we'll be able to get those applicants. I think the interest in walking and bicycling has just gone off the charts since the pandemic and certainly has been building over the years. Um, what we have committed to um, Brian and the committee members is that we will continue to have a conversation, I think at the next BPAC meeting, about the process for transitioning new members and um, those who've been uh, on the committee for a long time. And we certainly don't wanna rush that process. So we're still gonna have that conversation and maybe adjust what we looked at in terms of those term limits. Um, so I just wanted to bring it to the board's attention and invite Brian up if he wanted to say a few words about that. Um, certainly respect all he's contributed over the years to Pinellas County transportation, particularly the trail network. Thanks, Whit. Uh, Brian Smith, uh, chairman of the BPAC. And um, what I think we wanted to talk about was the improvement of the committee and uh, sort of having it more all-inclusive than it is now. However, we've also got people on the committee that have been there for years that basically add something to the committee. You've got 12 technical people from cities and county, and then you've got uh, 23 people that are citizens, that have citizens background. And they also know trails and they come from different organizations, they're consultants, this sort of thing. So um, when we put this package together, there were two parts of the term limits added. One was a four-year term, second was no more than two terms. And um, after we kind of polished that off in the committee report, I went home and, and noticed the chart in the back about how this change would happen. And, and what I realized was if we did it the way with the term limit, meaning that you couldn't be more than two terms. What would happen would be within the next year or two, uh, you would have out of the 23 people, 14 would be eliminated from the committee, which seemed pretty pretty quick. And the other is we've had a lot of trouble trying to get people on the committee that have certain kind of backgrounds to work with because there's a lot of people interested in bike pedestrian, but when you really come down to it, how many people want to attend a meeting at 8.30 in the morning Monday once a month, that sort of thing. So I think what I'm, I'd like to do is have us have a dialogue a little more with Wit about, I think the four year term is necessary because right now there's no term, but then how much you put in a term limit, is, is it could, you could actually review it every two, four years, and that gives you the opportunity to add people, but not sure that it's gonna be harmful to the committee and the process we have. We've got a nationally recognized program and don't wanna lose that, that, that initiative, you see what I mean? So anyway, that's, um, so I'd like to work a little more with Wit on the, uh, the package. And this is not an action item for the board, so it's really just information. But if anybody would like to respond or ask questions of me or Brian, welcome that. I love the idea of a legacy committee, and it sounds like a great way to make sure that we are still assisted by this incredible knowledge and insight that you have. So thank you so much. Good. Well, Anyone else? Okay, thank All you. All right, Brian. thanks, Brian. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay, I will move on and try to get through these others really quickly. Um, I think we're setting a good pace here. We did have uh, the TMA leadership group meeting, oh, I'm sorry, annual call for projects. Uh, so I wanted to let everybody know that we have issued our um, call for projects for three grant uh, program areas. Our Complete Streets program, which you heard Cheryl's presentation earlier today, that was funded partially through that. Our Transportation Alternatives program, which is our federal dollars that go to bicycle, pedestrian, and related uh, improvements. Um, and that uh, is also out. And then our multimodal transportation priority list, sort of the big list of major transportation projects. And um, the difference between some of those is that the transportation alternatives tend to be smaller bicycle and pedestrian projects. If you want to build a trail overpass over you know, a big highway, that would go on the multimodal project priority list, not the TA list, because we, we limit those at under $2 million, I believe. Uh, the multimodal priority list, I think we added five or six projects this past year from the call for projects. Was it four? Three? Three. We added three. We hope to get a lot more applications, and um, you know, so I would encourage you all to talk these up, to encourage your local governments uh, and your partners to submit through our process. When I told you about uh, getting after one of our state representatives about legislative earmarks, this was my message, was go through our process. Um, it, it levels the playing field for everybody. It allows us to look at countywide and uh, related issues. It, 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 it gives us in the Florida Department of Transportation an opportunity to think these projects through and how they can be best executed most efficiently. Um, when we go through the legislative earmark process, it can get real muddy in a hurry and can get very difficult and we've seen some wasted dollars through the legislative earmark process. So um, share these announcements, if you will. Anything that we can do to help you would be, would be welcome. The next item is we had our TMA leadership group meeting on June 25th, and the only thing I really wanna say about that is they did what they had to do, which was they adopted the regional transportation priorities for the multi-use trails, uh, and what was the other thing? Trip, oh, the Transportation Regional Incentive Program. Um, the Florida statutes requires that the TRIP program uh, be prioritized by working collaboratively in these regional frameworks like the Suncoast Transportation Planning Alliance. Um, and you can't get TRIP funds if you don't work through that framework. So they did their job and that's, that's really their main responsibility in addition to having the conversations that we have. Um, and I thought that was a successful meeting, and thank you, Mayor Bajowski, for stepping in uh, and participating in that meeting. Um, I, I want to bring you to those meetings more often because I think you've got a good voice for um, helping ensure that Pinellas is well represented. And uh, when when things get a little difficult, I'm gonna uh, gonna want you there sometimes. So I appreciate that. <laughs> The last thing I want to mention, or last two things, is um, in September you will have a presentation from the Federal Highway Administration about this MPO certification. Uh, and uh, overall it was very good, uh, very positive. I think they found one small thing that they wanted us to correct and you've already acted on that and made that correction. Uh, but they will be giving a presentation. Uh, I didn't release the report. Uh, it'll be in your September packet, but the report is very good, very positive, and I just wanted to let you know that that was coming, uh, and we appreciate our federal partners and our state partners because everybody you know, is involved in this in the MPO world. Last thing I want to mention, speaking of our federal partners, is uh, thanks to Commissioner Long, I had a conversation with Deputy Assistant Secretary <clears throat> for the US DOT, Charles Small, um, and invited Secretary Buttigieg to be the keynote speaker of our Gulf Coast Safe Street Summit in November. Um, he didn't accept yet, but uh, we have a letter that we are drafting and will send, I hope by the end of this week, um, to him specifically inviting him to be our keynote speaker. And Charles Small said he would run interference to help make that happen. Uh, and get the letter in front of his scheduler. So, um, and if we don't get the secretary, uh, he said that he has three or four names at the top of the US DOT that would be very capable speakers on the issue of safety uh, and bicycling, walking, and things like that. So that was a great conversation. I wanted to share with you, though, two other bits of information that came out of that conversation. Uh, and, and it's an advocacy request. And so I think I need the board's support uh, to do this. Uh, right now, Congress is negotiating the federal uh, infrastructure package. 
Uh, and one of the sticking points is there's $50 billion uh, included in the negotiated bipartisan agreement uh, for transit. And um, according to uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary Charles Small, um, the Democrats want $50 billion to go toward expanding transit service, uh, and the Republicans want it to only be used for state of good repair. And I think this board has said that we want to see funding that's flexible and that um, furthers all modes. Uh, and so the Democrats' version of this does not preclude the money being used for state of good repair. And the Republican version would limit it only to state of good repair. So places like Pinellas County might benefit from state of good repair, but we would also benefit from an infusion of dollars that could be used in the capital investment grant program that's funding the Sunrunner uh, bus rapid transit program. So I would like to seek the board's support in advocating for the full expansion of, of those dollars in addition to state of good repair and not just limiting it to state good repair. The second item is that AMPO and NARC and these other regional MPO organizations are advocating for um, increased flexibility of funding for MPOs through this infrastructure package. So there's uh, I forget the dollar amount, but I believe it's somewhere on the north of $500 billion in new infrastructure investment. Uh, these other organizations are asking for a complementary increase in funds through the Metropolitan Planning Program, the surface transportation program that we administer and we largely have control over. I think that's consistent with this board's policy of flexible transportation funding. So unless the board doesn't want me to do that, I would like to seek the board's permission to send a letter uh, on behalf of Ford Pinellas, basically advocating for uh, increased flexibility in MPO funds uh, and uh, this uh, flexibility of transit dollars to be used for both expansion and state of good repair. Uh, and also in that package uh, is billions, I don't know how many because they're still negotiating, in safety dollars that would directly go to local governments uh, rather than just to DOTs. And I think that's also a big sea change. That's not as controversial, um, but I would also include that in my legislative request. So do you all have any questions of me at this time? Commissioner Eggers. You said um, state of good repair. Uh, do you mean no, uh, traditional transportation, roads, bridges? that or what do you mean so in, in in the way this package is being developed the state of good repair would be for transit only um, there's there's road maintenance and other in other areas of okay. the bill um, but what the what the controversy I think it's in the Senate um, is that the um, the Republican leadership in the Senate wants to see the money limited to state of good repair which would be I mean I think PSTA needs those dollars um, it would be for uh, replacing aging vehicles. It would be for upgrading um, terminals like the Park Street Terminal downtown. It would be for just maintenance and rehabilitation of operations. Versus new. Well, yes, and, and what the Democrats are saying is both. And the both is new. The it's, other one's... It, uh, in allowing money for expanded transit service Okay, All right, I just want to make well. sure I was clear. Yeah. And to me, it, it, you know, we need both, but it just seems it's a little frustrating to see it being limited uh, at, that, at that very high level when there's different needs all over, the, all over the country. And if what you need is state of good repair, then that's fine. If what you need is expansion, then, then that should be an option, in my opinion. And I didn't mean to make it start partisan Republican Democrat. Yeah, well, it, it that's how it is. It, in it certainly got there quickly, um, and I'm not sure I'm comfortable dealing with that right now. Understood. Frankly, I don't know enough about it. I'd like to learn more about it. Okay, Commissioner. Well, I, can, I can certainly Gerard. support Whit writing a letter supporting that. Um, both. I mean, I think areas are different. New York City needs a whole lot of work on its subways. We need transit, period. Right. <laughs> I mean, it, there are a lot of different areas of this country. And it's not political. 
Commissioner, sorry, Council Member Gabbard. I mean, for me, the key word is the flexibility piece. Yeah. I mean, we've talked about that time and time again, flexibility with funding. So I certainly support you writing a letter and uh, would make a motion to have you do so. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Nay. Okay. And One Commissioner opposed. Eggers, I'd be happy to work with you and, and yeah, I'd like to understand it more instead of what we just talked about in five minutes. So Good. get you a little more yeah. comfortable with Thank that. Thank you. And, and I'd be happy to share a draft with the full board if you'd like to see that. Great. Chairman Rice, could we take public comment on that motion? I did not. Do we have to take public comment? I think it'd that? be a good idea. Okay. Well, um, uh, is there anyone in the room who would like to speak to the issue of us writing a letter? Um, help me with the wording, council member. Or what? A letter advocating for flexibility of transportation okay. funding in the new infrastructure package. Okay, thank you. And I don't see anyone in the room who wishes to speak. Do we need to take a vote again? No, you, okay. that's sufficient. Thank All you. Right. Thank you. That's my report. Okay. All right, any other uh, questions or comments for the good of the body? If not, uh, thank you very much. We will adjourn our meeting.